Well, welcome this evening. Um, when the 66 book series was presented in the elder meeting, immediately we kind of got excited about it and guys started claiming the books that they wanted to preach. And then someone said, Matt should preach Song of Solomon. And I was like, well, maybe not. Um, maybe someone else should. And they're like, no, you'll do, you'll do a great job. I'm like, yeah, okay, thanks. Um, somehow it's the first one that I've gotten to. Um, so here we are tonight, reading, going through the Song of Solomon. So turn there with me. Um, as I started to prepare this lesson, I went out to some of the pastors that we know and love and went on their websites and tried to c accumulate a database of resources. I went to John MacArthur's website and pulled down every sermon he's written on it, which was zero. <laughs> I was like, well, John Piper likes poetry. Let's grab all of his, um, once again, zero. And then I started going one by one through each TES campus. And at the end of my research, I found one Sunday sermon, one closing sermon of a marriage conference, and one two-part Bible study class in 10,000 sermons. <laughs> it's been kind of a running joke in our home that I had to preach this book. Um, I am surprised, honestly, to see my family here. <laughs> but why do you think this is? Why do you think we put this book on the shelf? I know in my Bible reading, it usually is one day of my reading through the Bible, and I walk away going, yeah, I have no idea what that means. Let's go on to the next book. Um, why do you think we let this book that God has put in the canon of his scripture be that kind of a book? I have a theory. It's pretty explicit, and it's really confusing. Um, it's a love poem attributed to Solomon, but we know that Solomon's love life is not exactly the biblical model of marriage, so we don't know what to do with that. There's a guy that has 700 wives, 300 concubines, swearing his allegiance to a single woman. I don't think that's the place you go to love-proof or affair-proof your marriage. Um, even within its own verses, it doesn't help itself. Looking at chapter 6, verse 8, he says, There are 60 queens and 80 concubines and virgins without number. My dove, my perfect one, is the only one, the only one of her mother, pure to her, who bore her. He literally just tried to flatter this woman by saying she's his favorite of 140 plus. Once again, I'm pretty sure that's not the biblical model of marriage. However, as tends to happen when we start to prepare a sermon, what started as a difficult study has now become maybe my favorite book. It is so sweet to see what's on the words of these pages. And so tonight, I hope to give you guys a glimpse of what I saw in the 470 words of Song of Solomon. So what is this book all about? Turn with me to Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 6. I love it when the so what is actually in the text. It makes it easy. And so verse 6 says, Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm, for love is strong as death, jealousy is fierce as the grave. Its flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. Many waters cannot quench, quench love, neither can floods drown it. If a man offered for love all the wealth of his house, he would be utterly despised. Stated a different way, God-ordained marital love cannot be broken or extinguished. It cannot be bought for all the wish riches of the world. Like I said, on the surface, that feels like a contradiction to the context of this book. So let's dig in and figure it out. Solomon wrote the Song of Solomon. Kind of goes without saying, but let's say it. Look at verse 1 of the entire book. The Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. Smed did a great job last week of giving us a background of Solomon in his Ecclesiastes lesson, so I can skip some of that. But for the sake of review, we know from 1 Kings chapter 2, Solomon was David's second child born to Bathsheba. David passed on to him the kingdom of Israel. He reigned before the kingdom was divided and therefore reigned out of Jerusalem. It seems to me that part of the setting of this book is in Jerusalem in his chambers. I personally think this book was written early in his reign. There's a lot of debate around that, and it's hard to kind of nail it down. Um, 
But if you look at the size of his harem at the end of his life, he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. And here they mention 60 wives and 80 concubines. So let's just ballpark it at the first quarter of his reign. That assumes that the accumulation of women that Solomon had over his life was linear, which is a really hard statement to say out loud. The Song of Solomon's is a direct translation of the first verse, or the Song of Songs is a direct translation of the first verse. And that's the true title of this book. There's another way of reading that. Song of Songs is a superlative. The King of Kings or the best of the best is another way to read that. This should literally be read Solomon's greatest song. So we know Solomon wrote thousands of Proverbs and he was granted wisdom from God. Do you know he was a songwriter? First Kings 4, 29 says, and God gave Solomon wisdom and a very great discernment and breadth of understanding in his heart like the sand that is on the seashore. And then jumping down to 32, it says, and he spoke, he also spoke 3,000 Proverbs and his songs numbered 1,005. So this is number one of 1,005. This song didn't just make his essential album, but it's considered his greatest hit. In fact, it's the only single song in human history to make the canon of scripture as a book to in and of itself. This could be argued as the greatest song ever written, beating out the likes of Hey Jude, Satisfaction, God Only Knows, even beating out Amazing Grace, Great is Thy Faithfulness, and the Old Rugged Cross. The book that most of us have not read closely is the best song ever written. So let's talk a little bit about some of the historical ways people have approached this book. Tonight we're spending time examining song lyrics. This is an incredibly poetic song and it tells a story. I'm a child of 90s alternative music. Some of the bands I listened to growing up had nonsense lyrics. They were so vague, no one could really understand them. If you're gonna tell me that you knew or know what Kurt Cobain met in any of his songs, you're lying. The man's no longer alive and his lyrics are up for interpretation. The true meaning of his songs cannot be known. This song is not that for one primary reason. The Song of Solomon, Solomon's greatest hit, is the canon of scripture. God has written scripture to be understood and known, and this book can be understood. But how we're gonna go about understanding it is the key. I've seen this book wrongly interpreted as, as an allegory. People do weird things with it. Did you know the phrase that Jesus is the lily of the valley comes from an allegorical interpretation of this book? People take what I'm going to coin as the nirvanic approach to interpretation, and meaning they have no idea what it really means, so they're gonna spiritualize it and say there's something deep to this. They over-spiritualize it, so they say that the story is of Christ and the church. The bride is Christ, and therefore Christ is the lily of the valley. This isn't how we should interpret scripture. This book, although it is a song and poetry, and although there are stanzas in the book that are really confusing, I believe this book is clear. It contains real characters at a real time about real love between a real man and a real woman. And God intends to show us something both about himself and about marital love in this book. And that's what we're going to study tonight. Before we dig into the actual text of the book, I need to give you guys a little bit of an interpretive helper. In English, the pronoun you has no gender. However, in Hebrew, it does. In English, when you read, you are my favorite person in the world, you need context clues to know who that person is. You wouldn't know the gender without something else in the conversation leading you there. But if you read Jenna, you are my favorite person in the world, you would know that you is female. However, in Hebrew, the gender is built into the word you, like the English words his or her. Unfortunately, many of our English translations don't help us with that, and they leave us to context clues. I've noticed that the headers in a lot of our English translations are pretty unhelpful because they make interpretive decisions that are not in the text. However, the ESV has been super helpful in translating this book because it puts a he or a she in the header to help us understand the gender of the person that is talking. It looks at the gender of those yous 
and responds to it by giving us headers that help us understand it. That was a useful tool as I went through and studied this book. And so I actually copy and pasted everything into Word and then went through and highlighted every single pronoun in the book and tried to name who was a part of that pronoun so that we could understand what, so I could understand what I was reading. And that leads me to two historical views of the characters of the book. There are two ways to look at the characters in this book. These are commonly referred to as the two character view or the three character view of the Song of Solomon. Over the history of the literal historical interpretation of this book, the three character view has been the prominent view. However, more recently, like in the last hundred or so years, the two character view came into prominence. I actually have a theory that it's because of that English translation not giving us clues into who the yous are and people have taken weird approaches to it. In my study, I believe that the three character view is the most clear view of this book. In reality, as you read through the book, there's like six, or you could even call it close to 10 characters when you talk about different people that are just interacting. Um, but the primary four characters in the book that we're gonna focus on tonight are Solomon, the Shulamite woman, the shepherd, and the daughters of Jerusalem, which I believe are Solomon's harem, some subset of that 140 women we talked about earlier. The character that seems to have the most debate is the shepherd. So I want to quickly touch on why I believe he is a distinct character, and I think that's going to enhance our review of this book as a whole. This might be the world's longest intro, but we'll get there, I promise. The confusion and interpretation of Solomon is named. The confusion and interpretation is that Solomon himself is named, and the shepherd is not. So we have to decipher who is being spoken of from the context of those passages or stanzas. We cannot just assume that every time there's a he in there, it's Solomon and all the she's are the Shulamite woman. We have to read it in its context and decipher what it presents, and I believe this presents a second male character. So there's 117 verses, 470 words, and really quite a few clues. Um, we're not gonna look at all of those clues in context, but I do wanna walk through a few of them. Um, turn with me to chapter one, verse seven. She says, the Shulamite woman says, tell me you whom my soul loves, where you pasture your flock, where you make it lie down at noon. For why should I be like one who veils herself besides the flocks of your companions? This shows us a male character with a job that is clearly not a king's job. The sp person speaking in this is the Shulamite woman and she is introducing her beloved in this book. He is referred to her as her beloved 32 times, um, 25, she names him my beloved. So I believe that's actually a, almost a proper noun in the book. She's actually referring to a distinct person when she talks about her beloved. And who is that person that she loves? He clearly has a job and that is to shepherd the flock. His companions are with him in the fields. That to me doesn't sound like the son of an inherited, a son that inherited his father's kingdom. Solomon is not the type of person that would be in the fields like that. Let's turn the page to chapter 2, verse 15. She says again, Catch the foxes for us, the little foxes, that spoil the vineyards, for our vineyards are in blossom. She's referencing her beloved in this section, and they work together in the vineyards. Him as a shepherd doing his shepherd things, helping her care for the, her vines. There are several verses that touch on this relationship of them working together in the vineyards. They actually build a relationship outside of Solomon's chambers, the setting for chapter one. They clearly work together in the fields. Once again, this context leads us to believe her beloved is someone other than Solomon. Now I wanna peek at a few verses that are concurrent. If you look at verse two, seven, three, five, and eight, four, they're virtually the same. Eight, four is a little bit different. Um, but the, the emphasis is the same. So I'm going to read 2.7. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or the does of the field, that you not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. She's making a petition to Solomon's harem, harem to not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. 
This is to say, do not try to counterfeit love beyond its normal means. Walter Kaiser explains it this way. The maiden adjures the ladies of the court at Jerusalem not to attempt to awaken or to prematurely kindle love by any improper or unfair means. She has already given her heart to the shepherd, so all attempts to flatter her into switching her allegiance to Solomon, even though he is the king of the land, will be unjust and an unfair stirring of love before it is time for such a consummation of their love. She wishes to be left alone, just as the gazelles and the does of the field show the same kind of shyness, but who are also quick to leap to an escape. She is as content as she can be. The woman did not agree with the harem's view of love. Seeing these clues, it changes a little bit about the way we read this book. If you read many of her stanzas as if she's describing Solomon, it frankly doesn't make logical sense. How is she talking about her true love and arguing with the daughters of Jerusalem? Why is she saying a bond is bound by God in contrast to Solomon's pleas with her to marry him and be added to his 140 women? Why would Solomon's heron ask her what makes her beloved so great? Why would she go to the guards and ask them to find her beloved if he is King Solomon? Why, when finally convinced, would Solomon's heron ask her if they can help her find her beloved? The story, story clearly describes a second male character that we will call the shepherd. So let's read it with him there. Put another way, if you read this book as if there's no shepherd, it really doesn't make sense. And if you read her beloved as a distinct character, which is the shepherd, it makes a ton of sense. So as you see the phrase, my beloved, think of the shepherd. Think of her true love, not Solomon. I also want to say this isn't just a Matt Kelso view of this book. Walter Kaiser has a great commentary on the book that holds this view, as well as William Varner. These are men that are much better than I am in the Hebrew and have both published amazing resources for the book. Varner actually led me to this conclusion, and once I saw it, I can't unsee it. I can now read Song of Solomon with clarity. So what's the story of Song of Solomon? First off, it's not really written in chronological order. A lot of songs aren't. It starts in Solomon's chambers, but seems the middle of chapter six describes when he brought her there. It is clear, but still poetry in a song, and yet it clearly tells the story of a Shulamite woman that is betrothed to her beloved, her true love. They are ready to be married when King Solomon kidnaps her and brings her to his chambers with his harem of women. He is transfixed with her beauty and uses every trick in his book to try to woo her to him. Both the harem and Solomon try to convince her to leave her beloved for Solomon. Her heart is knit by God to her beloveds, so she is not drawn in by Solomon. She ultimately escapes and is reunited with the shepherd. That's the story. So let's read chapter 8, verses 6 and 7, knowing this story again. Set me, a Shulamite woman, as a seal upon your heart, my beloved shepherd, as a seal upon your arm, for love is as strong as death, Jealousy is fierce as the grave. Its flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of Yah. Many waters cannot quench, neither can floods drown it, if a man, even Solomon the king, offered for all the wealth of his house, he would be utterly despised. Solomon's greatest hit is the story of how the wisest king of Israel could not woo away a working woman from her true love. All right, that's the intro. Where are we at? Um, tonight, we're going to look at the message of this book and see that God-ordained marital love cannot be broken or extinguished. It cannot be bought for all the riches of the world. To illuminate this message, I want to focus on three tenets of God-ordained marital love from Solomon's greatest song. The first one, God-ordained marital love is stronger than worldly temptations. There are multiple verses where the harem and Solomon try to entice the Shulamite woman with status, and she doesn't seem to be tempted. Let's read. The daughters of Jerusalem say things like this. Solomon 1, 4, the second half of it, they say, We will exult and rejoice in you. 
We will extol your love more than wine. Rightly do they love you. And then moving down the page, in verse 11, they say, We will make for you ornaments of gold studded with silver. And then turning probably two pages, they say, Eat, friends, drink, and be drunk with love. And then the last one I'm going to highlight is, they say, What is your beloved more than any other beloved? O beautiful, most beautiful among women, what is your beloved more than another beloved? That you must adjure us. They're asking her, what makes this beloved guy so great? And then there's Solomon. We'll touch on his attempts to flatter her in a second. But the narrative of chapter 6, verses 10 through 12, is that one spring day, as she was visiting her family's nut orchard, quite unexpectedly, King Solomon's posse shows up. When he observed her, he was immediately struck by her unusual beauty, and he determined to make her another member of his growing harem. He had brought her to Jerusalem and handed her over to the care of the palace women, as he promised her all sorts of gifts. Solomon and the harem tried to woo her with status and wealth, and she was not enticed thousand others were, right? There's 700 wives and 300 concubines. They ended up getting enticed by this. Um, She wasn't. The Shulamite woman and her beloved had a bond of a God-ordained love, and this bond could not be broken by any temptations. How can this be? That leads me to my second point. God-ordained marital love is rooted in more than just physical desires. We're going to look at two approaches. We're going to look at Solomon's approach and then look at the relationship between the Shulamite woman and and her beloved. So let's look at Solomon's approach. There are three major stanzas of Solomon proclaiming his love to the Shulamite woman. We don't have time to read every word of them, and frankly, some of them are explicit, and I don't want to read it. Um, But let's look at Solomon chapter 4. Song of Solomon, chapter 4, and we're going to scan through verses 1 through 15. I want to highlight something for you. He says, Behold, you are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful. And he goes on for 15 verses describing her physical beauty. Look closely. He makes no mention of anything else about her. He comments on her eyes, her hair, her teeth, her lips, her mouth, her cheeks, her neck, her breasts. He says, you are altogether beautiful, my love. There is no flaw in you. You have captivated my heart, my sister, my bride. You have captivated my heart with one glance of your eyes. He was transfixed on her physical beauty, and she didn't even seem to care. Her response was not that of a smitten woman, but actually one that was tormented by this situation. Remember, he functionally kidnapped her, took her to his chambers, and is now trying to woo her by describing how physically beautiful she is. And she says in chapter 5, verse 2, I slept, but my heart was awake. Her king had taken her, and she showed no desire for Solomon, but was tormented by the circumstances she was in. All she could do, and if you keep reading chapter 5 there, all she could do was long for her beloved. Yet Solomon did not give up so easily. Let's look at chapter 6 and see his next attempt. Starting in verse 4, he says, You are beautiful as Tirzah, my beloved, lovely as Jerusalem, awesome as an army with banners. And then he goes back to describing her attributes, her hair, her teeth, her cheeks. This is where he says there are 60 queens and 80 concubines and virgins without number. My dove, my perfect one, is the only one the only one of her mother, pure to her who bore her. I know I've read that, but seriously, nothing entices a woman like saying, of the 140 women I have, you're my favorite. This still worked like a thousand times for him, and I don't get it, but he was King Solomon, so there you go. Um, So let's read the last one, and that's in chapter 7. This is his last approach, or his last effort. And he doesn't change his approach. He just like doubles down on it. 
He says, how beautiful are your feet and sandals, O noble daughter, your rounded thighs, your navel, your belly, your breast, your neck, your eyes, your nose, your head. How beautiful and pleasant you are, O loved one, with all your delights. Everything in him was driven by a physical desire for this woman. No wonder the woman says to the harem three times, do not try to counterfeit love beyond its normal means. This is clearly the case of a king lustfully trying to entice a woman with riches, flattery, and a place of prominence, and all she cares about is the love of a lowly shepherd. I want to take a quick diversion here, because I find this so fascinating. This is Solomon's greatest song, the story of a woman that could not be wooed by the king who saw her as merely a sex object. But most people believe that Proverbs 31 was teaching from Bathsheba to Solomon. Single guys, this is a lesson. The Song of Solomon is not a book or a guideline for what a woman must be. However, tradition says that Solomon did have that guideline and he didn't seem to hear the counsel. As much as you may think you do not need a woman with hair like a flock of goats, cheeks like halves of pomegranate, or a nose like the Tower of Lebanon. You should be enticed by the things found in Proverbs 31. Turn there with me really quickly. I just think saying that you have a nose like the Tower of Lebanon is just a terrible thing to say to almost anyone. I, I don't know the context, but, or I think I know the context. It doesn't help it. Proverbs 31, starting in verse 10, it says, An excellent wife who can find, for her worth is far above pearls. She then goes on to describe attributes in this wife like the following. She is trustworthy. She is hardworking. She is giving. She is your cheerleader. She is strong. She is full of joy. She's your greatest counselor. She's loving. She's frugal. She's a good mother. And it closes with, Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears Yahweh, she shall be praised. The irony of this story is I think the Shulamite woman was a Proverbs 31 woman. If you look at her, she was trustworthy. She didn't waver from her beloved. She was clearly hardworking. She worked in the fields persistently. She was strong and she was loving and the list could go on. But in Solomon's attempts to woo her, he didn't care about these things. In this story, the king was enticed by her beauty and only her beauty. His false love was rooted in physical desires. God-ordained love is not that. So let's look at the Shulamite and the shepherd's examples. For example, let's start by looking what we know about the relationship between the Shulamite and the shepherd. Go back to Song of Solomon, turn to chapter 1, look at verse 5. In this verse, in 5 and 6, the Shulamite woman actually describes herself in it. She says, I am very dark but lovely, O daughters of Jerusalem. Like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon, do not gaze at me because I am dark, because the sun has looked upon me. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard... I have not kept. What does this tell us about her? Well, she has brothers. At some point, they were angry at her and made her work in the vineyards. During that time, she likely became tanned, which generally in that day was not a very attractive trait. And because of her time in the fields, she didn't pay attention to her own beauty regimen. She did not partake in the normal practice of finding a husband by looking on, focusing on her looks. But something amazing happened in those vineyards. Although working them was a punishment from her family, she met her beloved there. Jump down to verse 16 of chapter 1. Behold, you are beautiful, my beloved, truly delightful. Our couch is green, the beams of our house are cedar, our rafters are pine. In this context, I believe she's sitting in the chambers of Solomon and is looking around at the beams of his house and longs for her time in the pasture with her beloved. The context of their love was in the pastures and it was the green couch of their time together. Write down chapter two, 15, 10 through 15 in your notes. I'm not gonna read it, but this is an extensive section where the Shulamite woman quotes her beloved 
In it, she references times when they were together in the fields. The relationship is centered around verbal exchanges together in the vineyards that they worked in. And then let's turn to chapter 5, verse 9. Outside of the so what two verses we've read a couple of times, this is actually my favorite section in the entire book. In this section, the Shulamite woman is describing her beloved to the daughters of Jerusalem. So let's read together. Let's start at verse 9. This is the daughters of Jerusalem saying to the Shulamite woman, What is your beloved more than another beloved, O most beautiful among women? What is your beloved more than another beloved, that you must adjure us? The harem is asking, What makes this guy so great? And she answers. She says, My beloved is radiant and ruddy, distinguished among ten thousand. His head is the finest gold, his locks are wavy, black as a raven. His eyes are like doves besides the streams of water, bathed in milk, sitting beside a full pool. His cheeks are like beds of spices, mounds of sweet-smelling herbs. His lips are lilies, dripping liquid myrrh. His arms are rods of gold, set with jewels. His body is polished ivory, bedecked with sapphires. His legs are alabaster columns, set on bases of gold. His appearance is like Lebanon, choice as the cedars. His mouth is most sweet, and he is altogether desirable. This is my beloved. This is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. She clearly adores this man. She sees every aspect of his physical body as one to be treasured. I'm not saying physical attraction is to be ignored, but she closes. This is my beloved. This is my friend. The intimacy these two experienced in the days of tending the vineyard and a flock blossomed into friendship. This is clearly not something Solomon is offering, and it is something that is so much more valuable than all the physical beauty in the world. She called, her him, she called him her beloved 25 times, but here and just here, in her closing argument of her stalwart love for him, she says to Solomon's harem, this is my friend. And look, their disposition changes. Chapter 6, verse 1, they respond with, Where has your beloved gone, O most beautiful among women? Where has your beloved turned, that we may seek him with you? Even they knew deep down that there was something unique about God-ordained love with this shepherd. And that leads us to my final point. God-ordained marital love is sealed by God. Go back to chapter 8, verses 6 and 7. Set me, a Shulamite woman, as a seal upon your heart, my shepherd love, as a seal upon your arm, for love is as strong as death, jealousy is fierce as the grave. Its flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of Yah. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it, if a man even Solomon the king offered love, for love all the wealth of his house. He would be utterly despised. The Shulamite woman and the shepherd's love was tested like few others have been tested. Solomon was a catch. He was wise and the king of Israel. He had riches more than a young lady working her family's vineyard could ever imagine. And yet Yahweh sealed her love to another. True marital love is as strong as death. I want to look at these two verses and list off five ways marital love is sealed by God. The first way, God intertwines identities. Set me as a seal upon your heart. She desires to be a seal, which in that culture consisted of a small cylinder worn around the neck on a chain or a beaded string of some sort as a form of personal identification. This identification seal could be rolled out on wet clay or a ring could be pressed down as equivalent of a personal signature. Both the seal and the ring were deeply engraved with characters or pictures that functioned as an identity or authorization of the person it represented, much like a signature on a check today. Thus the seal was fully equating with the person or him or her. She wanted her identity to be sealed and aligned with his. They were one identity. 
God intertwines identities. Number two, God creates an unbreakable bond. For love is as strong as death, meaning it has such a strong intensity that there are few things that adequately compete with it. Marital love wants to protect, guard, preserve, and give oneself to the other. In fact, it has a jealousy that is as tenacious as its grip, it's tenacious in its grip as the grave. The third way that God seals, or that, um, yeah, God seals marital love is that God provides an unquenchable desire. Looking back at that verse, it says, many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. There's no amount of water, nor are there any rivers or floods that can wash away genuine love that God has placed in a marriage as defined in the Bible. This kind of love will persevere despite all the waves of adversity, suffering or trials that can possibly arrive in marriage. And adversity, suffering and trials arrive in every marriage. Little, if anything, can destroy this love that God has given to a couple. And then number four, God establishes its value. That's in the second half of verse seven. Walter Kaiser highlights this point very well, and so I'm going to quote him. He says, No amount of money or other types of gifts can ever purchase or divert this kind of love away from its object. Solomon, with all of the riches of his palace and empire, had tried as hard as he could to attract the Shulamite's attention and favor. Nevertheless, even though he tried to win her and decisively lost, he was moved by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to record how he had loved this maiden, but eventually lost her to a lowly shepherd boy. Love will not tolerate the substitution of stuff, wealth, and riches as an alternative for the giving of oneself to another person. And then the last point is God makes marital love irresistible. Marital love's flames are the very flames of Yahweh himself. This is the only place in the book where God's name appears. This love is a flame from Yahweh. Since the flame is lit by God, there is little chance of it being extinguished unless the love is not tended and guarded with care. So one last time, God ordained marital love cannot be broken or extinguished. It cannot be bought for all the riches of the world. That's what Song of Solomon is all about. Let me pray. Lord God, thank you for your word. Thank you for making it clear. Thank you for um, putting a book that we may overlook in here and yet putting such truth in it. Lord, help us not to skim or skip any part of your word. Lord, you have created love uniquely for us so that we can interact with each other in a way that we can see a glimpse of who you are and what your love is for us. And so thank you for that. Lord, help us to um, just love you more as we have read this book, Lord. In your name, amen.